Ariella, welcome to the podcast. It is so awesome to have you here. Thank you. It's so great to be here. You gave me such a nice dose of getaway when I read Gaycation in Paradise, which we will definitely be talking about later. And we're going to talk about your new book, too, that's coming in April. But before we get to any of that, I really have to talk to you about how you've written some of your very first books. Because Lucy yes. Lennox clued me into this on Facebook, <laughs> that you were writing on one inch by one and a half inch sticky notes while working a day job. How on earth did that come about? So that actually has a long history that goes back all the way to 2008. When I graduated college and my first job was working for a chiropractor as a receptionist, I didn't have a lot to do when it was like he was back there with the patient. So I had a three inch by three inch memo cube. So I would write my fan fiction on that. And I got very into the habit of sneak writing on notes when there was downtime where I couldn't do any work. And we had a very slow office, so there was a lot of it. But fast forward to being at the law firm, the reason it got switched to one inch by one and a half is the attorney in charge of the purse string said, you can't have three inch by three inch. You write one phone number on it, you throw it away, that's a waste. So only one inch by one and a half inch post-it notes. So I said, okay, if you're gonna make me use these tiny little ones, I'm gonna use a million of them. <laughs> so I came back to the law firm at the tail end of 2020 after having to leave my PhD program. Things happen where somebody will call in and be like, I'm not getting off this phone until the attorney's off the phone. Great, I'll put you on hold. And I would you know, sneak a couple of notes in while I'm waiting for them to get off the phone. Or the printer, I need to print something to do the next part of my job. And somebody printed down 3,000 pages of medical records and I can't do my job until that's over. So great time to sneak in some notes. So it just kind of became a thing. And then I wrote whole books on it. I actually have them. I keep them in a binder and I have this tiny microscopic rating where I would come home, put them all on a sheet of paper and I would double side it. And I just wrote whole books this way. I've written, I think, three entirely on notes. Oh my gosh. So this is actually Picture Love from my Good Bad Idea series. It was on 849 sticky notes. <laughs> I did a giveaway in my Facebook group where I said, hey, guess how many notes this book was written on? And whoever got the closest got a free paperback that I mailed them. It's a whole different take on the how many jelly beans are in this jar. <laughs> right. That was kind of what I was aiming for. So yeah, the, the guesses all were really low ball, maybe 200. I'm like, let's, let's get closer to 1,000. <laughs> how many words was that book? To put in perspective of how many post-it notes, 849, I think you said that was? Yeah. How many words was that book? So 849, I think Picture Love was probably about 63,000 words. Okay. I have very tiny handwriting, as you saw. And very so, yeah. neat handwriting, too. Like, this would never work for me because I'd never be able to read what I wrote later. <laughs> I actually have different handwriting styles depending on what pen I write with. I actually collect fountain pens. And normally I use a cursive italic nib, so I have this beautiful, very calligraphy flowing handwriting, but that doesn't work when you're trying to sneak write on sticky notes under your hand so no one notices. And so I have to write in my architect handwriting, which is in all caps, very tiny, even letters. And that was the only way I could make those notes work. <laughs> and it sounded like you would write the entire book on post-it notes. So, I mean, to that end, did you have post-it notes at home? Like, did you ever work on it at home? So instead of just what you were doing at the office, so you just write on more post-its? Yeah. So what I would do is I would write the sticky notes at the day job. If it was like a super busy day, maybe I'd only get in 30 to 50 notes. If it was a day where we were allowed to play, I could get over a hundred if there wasn't a lot to do that day, but it was busy office. So there usually didn't have many of those days. It was pretty much just like the day before Easter. <laughs> yeah. 
So I would come home and then I would put them all on a page and then I would transcribe them and actually type them up into Scrivener. And I would just do that every night when I would come home from work. And usually I would get about 1,500 to 3,500 words a day in that way. That's a great daily word count. Yeah. You know, I kept up with my work. Like I wasn't doing it to the detriment of the company. They had no idea what was happening. And the funniest part is the lady who sat next to me, who I was really good friends with, she would tell me all the time, you are such a good storyteller. You should totally write a book someday. I bet people would love it. And I'm over there just going, lady, you have no idea. Like, <laughs> <laughs> So I told her when I left the law firm and her and my assistant both basically died of shock and thought it was the funniest thing ever. So it was a lot of fun. I just absolutely love that. A great way to get through the work day. Yes. And, it kept me sane. <laughs> and get that word count in. Yep. As you're doing the post-it notes, does that make you, I'm guessing you're probably a pantser, or at least you were at the time, just to kind of keep the story flowing, or did you keep like a an outline somewhere else to reference? Yeah. So I actually had in Scrivener, I would have just a bare bones idea of where I was going, but my outline would be North conversation. It would just be little short things where I had, you know, a rough idea of where I was heading because I was working full time at the law firm. I was working part time as a coach for author ad school, which I still do. And I put out nine books last year. So that's a lot. So I kind of had to know where am I going? Is this worth my time? But within that, I had the freedom of being kind of a pantser and just letting it run free. So it's a little bit of a mix of both. Just vague guardrails and then go buck wild in the middle. (laughs) (laughs) And that's so where the fun is too, right? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I just, with certain characters like North and Ren, Felix, and my upcoming Noctis, I never know what's going to come out of their mouth, and I cannot tell you how many times I almost blew my cover laughing at their antics in the (laughs) office. Like, I'm just having to sit there being like, please don't laugh out loud. But if I'm making myself laugh, that's usually a good sign other people are going to crack up. So I was like, okay, just try to keep your chill so no one knows what you're doing over here. (laughs) So this really ties to your history of being a storyteller because you were doing these at the time three by three which sounds like such a luxury compared to one right? by one and a half <laughs> <laughs> you've got this history then of creating story and it really connects also to play by heart which is coming out on april 22nd because you've carried that story with you for 17 years Yep, since April 2005. Take us back to what got you started as a storyteller and then why play by heart is something you've held on to for so long. It has a little bit of a, a sad origin story in the beginning. I had been with somebody who helped train me as a writer when I was young in my teenage years. And we had been a couple and when we split up, it was kind of like, well, if he's not here to read my stuff. Why am I writing? Because I was young and just caught up in my feels. And so I had sworn off of writing. At the time, I was so judgmental and so hypercritical. I edited. It was a death by a thousand cuts. I hated everything I wrote. And part of that was because I had been trained to be hypercritical of myself. And so in 2005, I was very sick, unfortunately. I was an undergrad at NYU and I just was having a lot of health problems. So had terrible insomnia, woke up one day, went to my computer and I had a Word document. I had 15,000 words in it. I went, who who wrote this? I live alone at that point. So I was like, where did this come from? And I started reading it and I had never written romance and I had never written anything MM before. But I really liked Japanese yaoi, BL, all of that kind of stuff. I was really immersed in that culture since it was part of what I was studying at university. So I was like, wait, wait, what is this? And it was about this guy named Jason. And I was like, wow, what's his story? And it was the first thing I had ever read that I had written that I really liked. And I was just so 
blown away by the richness of this character and I was like wait where did this come from like it was so deep in my heart it just clawed its way out and it had to wait until I was really sick to do it so I just kind of sat on it because I was like I don't remember writing it I don't remember what I was going to do with it and every so many months, I, the story kind of would pop up and go, hey, remember me? And I'd read that 15,000 words and be like, where was I going with this? It's so good. And I get so mad at myself for not finishing it. So it took until 2018, like an embarrassingly long time before a friend of mine went, who cares what 2005 you would do with it? What is 2018 you going to do with it? And it was like something unlocked in my brain. And I was like, oh, I can take this anywhere. But in 2018, I still thought stories had to have a heavy angst component for people to read it. I thought you had to have that last minute breakup. I was trying to put it in there. The story ballooned out to 94,000 words. I still had 14 chapters to go. And at the time I was in my PhD program working six jobs. I didn't have time to clean it up and figure out why is this not working? And so I knew it was good, but it just wasn't gelling for some reason. And then when I was working on Sweet Dreams, Jason pops up in Flossom Explorations at the epilogue. He just kind of just moseyed right on in there. And I was like, oh, okay, so we're doing this now. After that, I was like, wait a minute. I wrote it originally. It was set in Princeton, New York City, Philadelphia area, because that's where I live at the time. And I was like, wait a minute. He very much is part of my Sunnyside universe. But to be part of my Sunnyside universe, it is a low slash no angst world. And I realized that's what this story was missing. I was trying to force in a breakup. The sister finds out her older brother's dating her idol and they get into a fight and then there's a breakup. Awful. Like, it's just so unnecessary. Their communication was so good. It didn't make sense that there was a breakdown in it for such an arbitrary, artificial outside reason. So I stripped all of that out. I got rid of the mean ex-girlfriend. Like I just kind of reshaped it and just let them be happy because that's really the point I'm at in my life right now that over writing my sunny side universe, like I wanted my, to put some good out in the world. Like the world's really dark right now. So one of the best reviews I ever got is they said, my books felt like a warm hug from a good friend. And that's what I really want my work to be. So I thought, you know what, Jason, he has been waiting 17 years to finally see the light of day. And he had to wait for me to become a good enough writer to tell his story the way it was meant to be told. And I think it's one of my strongest works because he had to wait so long. So him and Orion have an amazing romance that is just allowed to be happy. And it's just so nice to finally be able to give that to them. It's been a long journey. So I'm really happy about how it turned out. Looking back on those original 15,000 words, how much of at least the crux of the story made it through to the 2022 version? Actually, more than you would think. The 15,000 word version started off in the basement of the bar where at the time the character's name was Chris, but I like having some more unique names. I'm a little bit known for it. So Chris became Orion and he went down to the basement to get some CDs for the street team that his sister was part of. And he runs into Jason in the basement. And that actually is still in the story. I started it a few steps before that. But it's the core of that meeting is still very much true to the original. Jason going home and meeting Orion's awesome family, all of that made it into the 2022 version. So those components stayed. The biggest things that got taken out is because it is a Bi Awakening story, Chris slash Orion had a really mean girlfriend. It didn't sit well with me. And I realized that their breakup 
didn't have to be there. Whereas the old girlfriend was really just this mean, awful, just like a caricature of awful girlfriend. She became Nyla and Nyla and Ryan, they are exes, but they parted on amicable terms because it was one of those, they just, they wanted different things. They grew apart, but they're still friends. And so they're still really supportive of each other. And to me, I think that makes it much more engaging relationship to see kind of how they're still helping each other in their own way. So that part definitely was one of the biggest changes. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about Play by Heart in a few minutes, because I do want to talk a little bit more about your history. But I will say before we move on from Nala, as we're sitting here at the end of February as we talk, I've read about 30%, so I've met Nyla. And I adore her. And I actually want her story as well, because she's got a story there that readers will see bits and pieces of. And I would love to see that someday as well, because I think there's interesting things going on over there. You mentioned you hadn't written romance at all before. You'd read a little bit, at least in Yaoi and in BL. Was there other romance, like in what you were taking in, either through books or media, that you were thinking about it? Or did this story just kind of pop out and then kind of open up the world of romance for you? Yeah, so 2005 me, she she was in a, in a rough spot. She had some issues going on to be polite about it. And, you know, she was cynical and she hated Hallmark and she didn't think true love was real. And, you know, her first true love had basically shattered her heart in a very dramatic fashion. So she was very anti-love in 2005. While I liked Yowie and that kind of stuff, like I would rather just shoot myself out of a cannon into the sun than watch a Hallmark movie back then. Now, me, love it. My books are basically Hallmark, but gay and steamy. Yes, like that's they are. kind of my brand at this point. <laughs> and so, you know, 2005 me just was so anti that, which is why when I read Yason and I saw this like really just intensely passionate kind of romance that just develops this this intense like insta love it was just like where did this come from and I think it was just that part of me deep in my heart that wanted that and was drawn to that I had to learn how to let myself kind of fall in love with love again and I resisted for about two years I just was like, I don't know, it's it's romance. I've never read a romance novel in my life. I had bad attitudes toward it just because of popular culture kind of ingraining that in us. And in 2007, I just, I had this story about these two characters from a Japanese show and they would not leave me alone. And my friend went, so write it. If you don't finish it, who cares? I went, oh, that's true. It takes the pressure off. And so I had to start writing this fanfic. And as I was writing it, it was a romance and people liked it and I didn't hate it. So because I was posting it as I was writing it, I didn't have time to edit it to death. And so because of that, it had more of a genuineness to it. It wasn't so militant in its editing. And I learned how to fall in love with people falling in love. And after that, I just became like a hopeless romantic, started watching Hallmark with my mom. And, you know, it was just from there, it eventually grew into, well, I've been writing fan fiction for 10 years. I have stories that, you know, are original. Let me start telling those. And that's how I kind of made the shift into self-publishing. As you made that shift from fan fiction and starting to watch Hallmark, what did you do to essentially like figure out the craft behind a romance novel? Because of course there's the beats that the readers expect and the kind of format that the readers expect. How did you start building that up in your brain so that when you started writing the longer work that it would fit together? Yeah, I um, actually, this is going to sound really funny. I didn't know that MM Romance in English existed. I thought it was just... It's okay. You're not the first that we've heard that from. Yeah, I just thought it was the realm of fan fiction, slash fan fiction. Like, that was the world I lived in through Japanese media. I never really thought, like, wait, what about in English with, you know, American people in it? Is that a thing? So when I finally started going, you know what, I think I want to transition into self-publishing, 
I started to do my research. I'm an academic. I was in academia for almost 20 years in higher education. So my first book was actually Lucy Lennox Borrowing Blue because it was the one I saw everywhere. I read it and I went, whoa, wait, this is awesome. So I blew through her entire Maid Marian series, went through all of Forever Wild, like just marathoned that. And after that, I went, okay, that was good. And what next? And I saw Ella Frank's cover for Robbie. And I just was in love with that cover. I was like, well, I got to read it. And it was MMM, which I love. So I was like, great, let me do that. And once I read hers, I went, hey, I think there's actually a place in the market where I might fit somewhere between these two. And I just kept reading you know, all of the really big names in the genre, like Amy Nicole Walker and Riley Hart, all of the, you know, the greats. And I went, I think I can do this. And so my first series, I learned some lessons of what not to do (laughs) and (laughs) a lot of lessons of what not to do actually. And so I made a break between being AF Soel, who does darker stuff and Ariella Zoel, who is just high heat and humor and heart. Like that is what I love. So it was definitely good to do my research. Do you still write as AF or are you all about the, the humor and light now? (laughs) So I have plans at some point, I'm going to relaunch my first trilogy. I think it needs a little bit of work or just new covers for it that are just really, I think people are going to respond to. So Someday I'm going to kind of do that. It's on my list of things to do this year. But right now my main focus is Ariella, just because it's so much fun to do things that don't have that heavy angst component. And I think in some ways it is more challenging to craft this world where you have to rely on the strength and interest of the characters. You know, if your characters aren't people who feel real, the no angst element people get bored. So I think it really takes a lot of craft to be able to support them with a story that doesn't rely on those, ooh, there was a car accident, ooh, there's a breakup, like those kinds of normal things that we see in that sort of stuff. You've mentioned covers a couple of times, and I have to ask this question about your covers to know how this kind of started. The Owen Zoel becomes so many different things across your covers, which I think is so wonderful and just a cute little bit to your brand. How did that start? So I'm very extra. So for AF, the reason it was AFOL is because I had a friend who's like, you are so extra AF about everything, said in a loving way. And I was like, she's absolutely right because one's good, a hundred's better. So when I was trying to come up with the branding of the Sunnyside universe, you can't have a Sunnyside universe logo and then a series logo, that's too much. I wanted something to kind of unify where at a glance you could tell all of these are part of the same universe without it actually being a logo. So I thought how cute would it be to substitute out the O in my name for something that's related to the story. So in Fancy Love, for example, Callum loves desserts and Rune cooks and bakes, and that's a real core element of their story. So I have this cute little cake dessert as the O in my name. So they all tie in. And for me, having that across my Good Bad Idea, my Sweet Dream series, Play by Heart, all of those logos in a sense, become a logo that unifies. If this is in here, it's sunny side. So it's kind of the marker for that. I love it. It's adorable. And I love how you're using it as the series logo too. It makes complete sense. So kudos to you on the marketing and branding side. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And Kate Ashwood has done an amazing job with the covers. She's very patient with me as I'm like, what about this cute little thing? Or should we try this cute little thing? Like she's very patient with me. I just think it's a cute little thing. And my readers get so excited. Like before I even do the cover reveal, they're like, what's the O going to be? So I think it's nice that they get excited about that. Because I just love little stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Let's talk more about Play by Heart. As we mentioned, it comes out April 22nd. So it's a little bit down the line, still about a month away. Tell everybody a little bit more about Jason and Orion. Yeah, so it's one of those, if you have read Sweet Dream series, which is not required, we see Jason pop up, we see him in Flossom Explorations, where he's at a photo shoot, 
And he's kind of joking about the fact that he's a singer songwriter who's famous for his love songs, but he's never been in love. And so it's just kind of there. And when you get to Vacation in Paradise, which is where you first met him, he's, you know, kind of talking about his dissatisfaction with life on the road. And Rook starts kind of telling him, like, hey, I met somebody, maybe now you might. And when we get into Honeymoon Ever After, Kieran starts telling him, you know, you're going to go to this open mic night at your friend's bar. Like, you're going to meet somebody. I'm going to, like, wish this on the Northern Stars because he's in Sweden at the time. He's like, if we're wishing on this Northern Lights, it has to happen. Like, you have too many people pulling for you. And so Jason just makes kind of a one-off comment. Like, the only way I'm going to believe the cosmic universe sent me Mr. Perfect, he needs to have a cosmic name. So if he shows up with a name like Cosmo, I'll believe it. But if not, I'm not here for that. (laughs) So he's kind of got this, like, doubt built in. And so when he sees Orion across the room at this open mic night, he's just enamored with him just from afar And so when they do have that encounter in the basement, when Orion goes down to get CDs for his sister, and he says, like, what's your name? Because he needs to know, like, is it, you know, just going to be Jim? (laughs) Like, what's your name? And so he says, you know, my name's Orion Donati. And he goes, "You're, you're literally made out of the wishes on stars. And so after that, Jason is just full tilt, head over heels, Orion needs a little bit more of convincing, but he still feels that pull to Jason where, you know, he's straight, but he just can't deny that there's something between them. I think it's a credit to Orion that he is very open-minded and he's like, you know, I wouldn't be feeling these things if there weren't something here. So I think that, you know, he's a shy assistant museum curator that grew out of the fact art history was like my first big academic love and so getting to kind of put in these bits of me in the art history and I've done that in previous characters like Brune with his interest in the French Revolution I could have a PhD in the French Revolution and what I know about it And thankfully, my readers are very good at indulging, like, my little weird interest kind of popping in here and there. So for Orion, you know, getting to share my love of art history and letting him kind of nerd out about certain art pieces that remind him of his relationship with Jason, I think, is what makes it really unique because not a lot of people are going, hey, here's this ancient Roman statue. I can make it relevant. That, yeah, that is a trick to kind of yeah. connect those pieces. <laughs> it's one of the things that I love so far about the book is that you've got this musician who's very self-confident, who manages to kind of push his way into this person's life who has, you know, is, is not famous and doesn't know fame, and yet make it seem so organic that he's just really pursuing this guy that he likes. And it doesn't tip over into like creepy stalkery or anything like that. Uh, Did you find that to be an interesting balance to keep so that it didn't seem like Jason was coming on too strong? Yeah, it was definitely a fine balancing act. I think the original version, he came on just a wee bit too strong with the slamming up against the wall and pinning him against the wall. Because in Japanese, you have the kabe don where you do the hand against the wall to pin him. And I was very much in that mode. So I backed off of that a little bit. But I think it's one of those he's trying to be respectful. He's trying not to go too fast because he knows... I already came on too strong at the bar. Like, I need to slow my roll. So he's at least aware and he's trying to become friends with him before things kind of step up, which is why they get to know each other on this really cute date and they start bonding over that kind of stuff. And then, you know, it's sort of organically just kind of takes its own shape. And so I think that it's important that Orion doesn't feel too overwhelmed by it because he's just so innately drawn 
to Jason. It's not just because he's a fan. He's just like this person just lights me up inside. And I don't know why, but you know what? I I don't want to be scared anymore. I'm just going to embrace this and see where we go. Yeah, it makes it an interesting bioawakening story because... He is so, as you put it, lit up by Jason and his looks, his music, his demeanor, the whole package just clicks in that moment at the show, which is just so wonderful to watch manifest itself. Yeah. And I think another really important element is when Orion takes him home for family dinner. That's a and huge deal. Yeah. It's a big <laughs> deal, especially when you've only known each other like two, three days. Yeah. <laughs> I come meet my whole family. And Although mom certainly meddled in that one just a little bit. <laughs> she did. Estelle, <laughs> she has a tendency to kind of work her magic. I think when Orion sees, here's a super world famous musician and he fits in Orion's home and he feels like part of their family. And I think it helps remove that you're a star element and really makes him more human and he's like you have a place in my family you do belong here and I think it makes it easier for Orion to start opening up after that because it's like your family now and I just think that's really sweet has it been a deliberate choice through some of these books to involve celebrity so much because <laughs> I'm two for two now of like big <laughs> star know. Rook and then there's Kiernan as well who's a movie star in his own right and now we've got Yason here, famous photographer, also moves through these books. Is that a part of your great. universe? It, honestly, it just kind of coincidentally happened to line up that way. It wasn't something I consciously did. I always knew that Rook's story and Kieran's were going to parallel each other just because they're both in that scandal together. So I just wanted both of them to have their happy ending because it would be really crummy if like Rook got his and Kieran's just out there still, you know, <laughs> being just random hookups and kind of miserable with it. And so I knew those would parallel. And because the they are famous, they are interacting with the famous French photographer Arsene, who was in Picture Love. So they kind of run in the same circles and it just made sense that when they're in that world, they're friends with Jason to build that into the next series. So it was just kind of a natural link, but Jason's really the big one in Harmony of Hearts. Book two is actually Make Music Together. It's about his drummer, Levi, who has a romance with his neighbor who he sings shower duets with and has never met. But they end up meeting at an open mic night and he's like, wait, you're my neighbor. <laughs> wow, you are very attractive. So I think for me, showing that these hugely famous people are just people, I think is kind of what keeps it from being too obnoxious. Like they're not, you know, over the top. Like they are very real people that are just, they need that kind of love that's been missing from their lives. And so these very grounded, real, regular people kind of give them that, you know, more that they had been missing. Mm -hmm. We've got a couple of questions for you from members of our Patreon community. And this is a great place for the first one that comes from Sarah. And she says this. First, Martin Mull said, writing about music is like dancing about architecture, which I'd never heard, but I think that's an absolute hoot. <laughs> it's great. It's, yeah. Sarah says that she's always interpreted this as, yeah, it's hard. I love musician protagonists, and writing a songwriter is a lot of layers of writing about music. What were the elements of Jason's skill as a songwriter and lyricist that you focused on intently in the story? Yeah, for one thing that was really important to me was to convey his voice. And when you can't hear him, in the traditional sense, like I can't be like, here, go play this song, it's him, trying to convey the magic of his spellbinding voice is a challenge. And there is actually, what I was studying for my PhD program was Japanese contemporary musical theater. And there's a company called Takarazuka Review. And all of the people in that troupe are women and they also play the male roles. 
And so there is this one actress who has since retired from the company, but her name was Nozomi Futo, and she goes by Daimon. And she just has this voice, and it's unlike anybody else's that I have ever heard. And I have gone to so many of her shows. And when I was working on this back in 2018, I went to see Daimon in Phantom, which is one of my favorite musicals and seeing my favorite person do it I literally flew to Japan just to listen to her sing my parents thought I lost my mind but her voice has this magical ability to just fill your soul with light and it just fills all of those cracks in your soul and makes you feel whole in a way you didn't know you needed and it's this incredibly sensual fulfilling experience that's just magical like it made me understand the phrase take me to church it's like her voice gets me there but it is just this completely visceral experience of listening to her voice fill this massive theater that fits like five thousand people and i was trying to kind of use that as an inspiration to show how Jason's voice kind of affects Orion because it's really this immense voice that just does things to him and so trying to convey that either people are going to get it or they're going to think I'm nuts it's one or the other (laughs) like I don't know which way it's going to go but I'm hoping they like it (laughs) if you've got any YouTube clips you want to share to us. We could put those in the show notes too, so maybe people can sample a little bit of this singer. I actually have a translated clip that my dear friend actually translated for me, so I can share it. Diamond plays the Phantom, and her oh. partner is Maya Keyhole, who goes by Keychan. She actually plays Christine. And it's not Andrew Lloyd Webber's version, right. it's yep. just Phantom. So it's the same story, but the songs are different, but Dylan's voice just has this richness to it that even on recording, it'll still blow you away. But in person, it is just, it fills your entire soul. Like, I just cannot describe it. But like when I would finish one of her shows, like I could not get up. I just had to sit there and just feel. It was amazing. Like I missed that kind of experience from living over there and her being part of the company still. Oh, yeah. Send that clip over, please, because I would like to see it. And I'm sure some of our our listeners here would love to see that as well. You wrote song lyrics in this book, too. (laughs) Did that come naturally to you? Or was that like, because to me, that's like poetry. And like poetry just makes my head explode in terms of like what it takes to be able to do (laughs) that. I thought I was really going to struggle with the song lyrics. And I thought I was going to agonize over them they just sort of came out like they were just sort of there and it was very weird to me and so I spent a lot of time being like are these a little too cheesy are they but for me that's kind of yes like it's so over the top because he hasn't actually been in love so he is building these song lyrics off of what he's seen in media and what he has heard in other songs. And so it's almost like this overly bombastic version. And I think that's why it kind of connected with people. And so once he's actually fallen in love with Orion, I hope you can see a shift in the genuineness of his song lyrics that are actually directed to Orion. I think you can see that kind of progression where they become more personal because it's finally real for him. So I try to convey that. The lyrics were awesome. I'd love to hear them set to music. If you ever like commission somebody to write the music side of that. Yeah. My, my big dream is someday to be able to do audio books and I would love to have my narrator sing those songs. Like I can hear him in my head. So I would love to find a way to make that happen. (laughs) What was your favorite scene to write in play by heart? Yeah, for me, the the scenes where the family are together, I think, really have a kind of magic where they all just fit together so neatly. And, you know, Estelle is just an awesome mom. 
and Neil is just the perfect dad. And I'm very lucky that, you know, I have fantastic parents. So it was very easy to model this family off of. And even the little sister, like she's so sweet. She's so over the top. And I think her journey in the book is really going to surprise people because the original version went very differently <laughs> than this version. And I'm really glad she gets to kind of be her own little hero in her story. And I think that the side characters like that, they usually tend to kind of fall by the wayside. So I like being able to have these female characters, especially that people love, like West in Love Directions. Like people want to be her best friend. <laughs> <laughs> Has your dad baked the dessert for Play by Heart yet? Or does that so happen not, closer yeah. to the release date? Yeah. So it actually happens on release day. He will make some kind of dessert. He doesn't tell me what he's making. It's just he'll bring it out and he'll be like, hi, I made a Hokkaido milk cream cake. And I'm like, what? I didn't even know you knew what that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he's he makes all different kinds of things. And interestingly, a lot of them are actually sugar free because he is diabetic now. And so he still wants to eat them. So he has managed to make actual cake that tastes amazing. Like I don't miss regular cake because his sugar-free ones are so good. Like it's magic. I don't know how he does it. <laughs> That's amazing. How did that tradition begin? Because I think it's, it's always nice to have people that support you, especially when it's your family. But this is like next level to go and make not just cake, but like things you would get on like, you know, British Bake Off or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's definitely taken things up a notch, especially over these last couple of books. Where that starts is he used to stress bake when he worked in corporate. And, you know, if I came home and there were three dozen cookies, I knew, you know, hard day at the office. <laughs> and so once I started publishing, like, bless my father, he just, he's always so supportive. So when my first book came out, Alluring Attraction, it's about a brothel. And so... There's a lot of scenes that you would expect to see in a brothel. And bless my father, he read that book. <laughs> and I kept telling him, Dad, you don't have to do this. You do not have to read it. Like, it is so not your book. Like, my dad is straight. You don't have to do this to yourself. And his response was, I got all kinds of an education. And I'm like, I'm sure you did. <laughs> So after that, I had been away at my PhD program. And so once I kind of had to move home after leaving the program, he just started making me a dessert to celebrate my releases because he's just so proud that I am publishing and doing all of it on my own. Like I'm doing my own layout and all that kind of stuff. And so he just likes showing his support. And then my family food is how we do that. And desserts is, you know, the best I love you in the world. So it just became a thing. And I started sharing it with my readers and my readers now are like, great, you have a book coming out. What's your dad making? <laughs> so I made a little bakery logo for him on my website. I have a secret page for people who join my newsletter where you can actually go to like my dad's bakery section. I have pictures of everything he's made for each of my books. And for Christmas, I got him an apron and I had the logo put on it that I designed for him. So now he wears it when he awesome. bakes and it's so cute. I love that. Way to go, yeah. dad. Yeah, it's always great awesome. to hear those support stories like that. Yeah. So now well, you and know he everybody. has his own fans, which is of amazing. Course. I you had a reader. Instagram. <laughs> Right? I had a reader in Australia, her name's Kylie, and she sent me a little care package and she included cookie cutters for my dad. And I was like, my dad got fan mail. Like, it's the best thing in the world. So yeah, it's definitely, I'm very fortunate. So yeah, our listeners who want to see the baked goods, because I've seen them because I'm on Ariella's newsletter, sign up for the newsletter because that link for that will be in the show notes so that you can see the baked goods as well. It is quite something and I'd love to come to your house for dessert. <laughs> we would love to have you. He cooks all kinds of things. I mean, chicken marsala, stir fry, curries. Like he, he runs the gamut. A lot of Italian stuff. It's amazing. I'm not the size of a house, quite honestly. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great moment here for another question from Sarah since we're talking about food. She wanted to know, you're feeling very snacky on a road trip. What's your convenience store 
of choice and what snacks are you buying, which is a big level down from dad's treat, but we've all got our convenience store snacks that we gravitate to for sure. Yeah, so I'll I'll be a little bit of a, a nudge on this one because convenience store culture in Japan is just next level experience. And I've lived in Tokyo for almost seven years at this point on and off. And so for me, when I think convenience store, I think Japanese convenience store, which is 7-Eleven. Fun fact, the Japanese company is 7 and I Holdings. They own the American chain of 7-Eleven. So it's actually a Japanese company, which not many wow. people know. So 7-Eleven is one of my favorite over there. And Lawson, my absolute favorite things in the world from a Japanese convenience store are Melon Pond, which is basically sugar cookie bread. It's so good. It just has this hard, like sugar cookie kind of a crust on it. It doesn't taste like melon. It's just really sweet and just such a good pastry. They have these things that look like dinner rolls, but they have chocolate cream inside of them. Those are really tasty. And my other, to round out my top three, they have these little crustless, peanut butter sandwiches that have like bits of real peanuts in them and so they're peanuts sandwichi which just sounds like I'm making fun of Japanese but I swear that's how it's actually pronounced and they are just this soft just buttery sweet like it is just so good like those are the three things I really miss from Japanese life and the melon pond they also have chocolate chip melon pond where it's just all sprinkled in with chocolate chips. It's just cannot get enough of that. It's so good. And you had me with something that had peanut butter in it. So <laughs> anything peanut butter makes me really happy. <laughs> so good. <laughs> now, of course, we have to talk about Sweet Dreams since Gaycation yes. in Paradise was my first book of yours. You've got me hooked on resort settings now. Yeah. For, for I mean, one when thing. you look at the cover, like who would not want to go to that blue water paradise? Right. I think it's Absolutely. Gorgeous. I'm all over that. How how did this particular series come about? Because you've got five books in that series, mm -hmm. I think it is. Yep. So that's a lot of resorts to write about. Yeah. So I have been very blessed that I have traveled all through parts of Europe, through Asia. I've definitely been very blessed to stay at some amazing hotels. My father, when he worked in corporate and when he, he has his own consulting firm, he would stay on projects where he would live down in Richmond for two years. He would go down Sunday at like two in the afternoon and he'd come back Friday at 11 o'clock at night. So most of the week, he just lived down in a hotel at a Hilton down in Richmond. Then he did it at the Poconos for like three years. So for a lot of time, he was just gone. And because of that, he has like a billion Hilton hotel points like a billion so because of that hotel stays are free and he's a diamond member so he gets some very nice upgrades so anytime i'm like hey dad i'm gonna go down to osaka do you mind if i borrow some points and i'll pay half and use points and he's like yeah sure take them and so because of that i would get upgraded to these incredible suites and hotel rooms in japan usually like if you do this you're touching both sides of the wall <laughs> Like hotel rooms in Japan are tiny. And I stayed at the Conrad, which is Hilton's like five star Uber Lux chain. And I stayed at the one in Osaka that was just this amazing, amazing suite that the shower had a window and you're on the 43rd floor. Wow. The hotel room was bigger than my bedroom. And in Japan, that's like unheard of. So it was like the height of luxury. So I liked being able to kind of bring that really luxe sort of hotel into it. And my logic behind Sweet Dreams was, you know, we're deep into the pandemic. I love traveling and I haven't been able to do it in many years because of the pandemic. So the last time I left the country was in 2018 to go see Diamond in Phantom. So I just thought, it would be nice to take everyone on a vicarious vacation and get a look at these amazing hotels to kind of base my ideas off of. And it was just sort of a fun little escape for me to do a getaway. And my readers ended up really liking it too. So it was fun. One of our patrons, Jess, was curious about what inspired the luxury suite idea. Certainly it sounds like Japan had a lot to do with that and this amazing yeah. Conrad Hotel. 
anything else kind of go into that? And Jess is also curious, did you take pictures of various hotels to help you build out the world? So I'm actually really glad that they asked that question because I do these visual guides as bonus material, again, for my newsletter subscribers, where I share the pictures of, you know, here's this incredible hotel I found in the middle of nowhere, Sweden, where the hotel, you're on like the ice and I'll post a visual guide on my website where it's like, here's the picture and I'll explain, here's why I picked it. How cool is this kind of a thing? And I actually, for the one for Gaycation in Paradise, I have all of these beautiful pictures of the Maldives and this incredible overwater villa hotel that has a video tour. So I like being able to base these hotels in really over the top luxury to have those awesome pictures to share with my readers and just be like, who would like to go on a field trip with me? <laughs> well, just reading Gaycation, I'm like, I need a trip to the Maldives because you capture so well the imagery of the place. I felt like I could, you know, not only see the room, but like the areas around when Rook actually decided to step outside a little bit and when Aldo would kind of like, we're going to go walk on the beach. It's going to be late at night. Nobody's going to see you, blah, blah, blah. But I got yeah. the feeling of what <laughs> that yeah. was like. So it was kind of like a little vacation for myself <laughs> at the yeah. same time. That's what I was aiming for, so I'm glad it took you there, because it's the Maldives is just stunning, stunning place. Unfortunately, I have actually never been. <laughs> I'm very sad about it. And when I was working on that, I was getting ready to publish it, and somebody at my law firm went on their honeymoon there, and I was like, I just wrote a book. Why don't I get a go? <laughs> <laughs> and these are such great escapes. Are they escapist for you as you write them, or are you too in the writing to feel the escape the rest of us get? Uh, working on them while I was sitting in my terrible toxic law firm, yeah, definitely an escape. Because <laughs> it's like, you know, the, the firm wasn't the best place in the world, which is why I'm so grateful to my readers for supporting me to the point where I could actually leave the firm. And it really was just a way for me to kind of still go to places without actually being there and the pandemic just it makes it really hard I have very bad lungs so I can't really travel I can't really go anywhere although I am excited I'm hoping the world will be in a better place so I am going to GRL in October so I'm very excited for that so hopefully the pandemic will let that go through so for me it was definitely escapist to just picture these gloriously beautiful, beautiful places to sort of build a new world. And in Love at Fourth Sight, I have Winter Vale. And Winter Vale, I have a feeling, will turn into its own little spin-off series somewhere down the road. Because it was just the people there, the locals, were just so much fun. Like I think that I could do some really fun things in Winter Vale. Now you're getting ready to do a different kind of escapism. Because you're yes. going to take a dive into MM Fantasy. Yes, I'm very what, excited about that. What can you tell us a little bit about that? So I am a huge fan of Alice in Wonderland. If anybody has read Snowbody Like You, which is book one of Sweet Dreams, it should not come as a surprise since there is a Alice in Wonderland role-playing scene with a very creative set of teacups, if I do say so myself. <laughs> <laughs> when I was working on that, I was like, oh, I have this idea for a, you know, Alistair in Wonderland, where it's a male Alice, and it's not actually the original Alice. It's going to Wonderland Ever After. Alistair is brought there to be the new Alice. And so he kind of gets brought into Wonderland and gets to meet all of these famous characters like Cheshire and gets to interact with them and be part of their world. And I'm really excited because book one will be Alistair with the White Rabbit. And then book two will be Cheshire. And book three is Hatter. And so I'm really excited for getting to show these characters that are so you know famous in popular culture and base it in the original Lewis Carroll works because obviously I can't touch anything Disney has ever looked at. Right. <laughs> so I think it's really 
it'll still have my same brand of heat, humor, and heart. It will be low angst. And for me, I've read so many Alice in Wonderland retellings where Alice is, you know, it's a dark, gritty, everyone's trying to murder Alice. She has to learn magic so she can defend herself. And like, I just, I want a fun Alice in Wonderland retelling where it's about the whimsy of the world and the magic of the world. And so having a low angst Alice in Wonderland universe, I think is going to be what makes it really unique. And so hopefully even people who are like, oh, no, fantasy is not my thing, that you're still going to have the same kind of characters in my contemporary stuff, be part of that world. I actually have a Kofi account where I've posted a couple of the sample chapters that I've written, and everybody has already decided Cheshire is their new favorite book boyfriend. And I'm like, yeah, he's, he's pretty great. He's, he's very ambish in a fun way, so... I'm very excited to kind of get that out, hopefully sometime, maybe late summer, if all goes according to plan. So no concrete date on that one yet, though. But the cover by Natasha Snow is just gorgeous. Yeah, I will share the fact to the listeners that I've gotten a sneak preview of that. Oh, my God, it is gorgeous. (laughs) Absolutely gorgeous. She's the best. When this finally gets released for its official unveiling, people are going to go absolutely gaga for it. I think so. It's just she did such a good job and she's actually getting ready to do cover for Cheshire's cover next in sometime in like late April. So I'm excited to see how that turns out. What was it like to flex slightly different muscles from the romance muscles and to do some world building and fantasy and things like that? I actually have written fantasy through my fan fiction and I actually have a like nine book series about a monk and a fox demon. And it's this world of incredible magic, but that's just sitting on my hard drive because like, it needs some work. And unfortunately, all nine books follow the same three characters, which tends not to be the norm. So I think that for me getting to do fantasy when I grew up reading so much fantasy is really kind of like a return to my roots for what I used to read. And so getting to bring in that fantasy element along with the romance that has like become my happy place, I think will make it a really fun adventure for everybody. If it does go well and everybody loves Alistair in Wonderland and the Wonderland Ever After series, then I have on deck a potential gender bent Wizard of Oz retelling that'll be based on the novels that I'm very, very excited about because I think it will have a lot of potential for some fun. That sounds fun. I'm even more into that than Alistair. And I'm pretty into Alistair too because of the spin that it sounds like you're putting on it. So yeah, hopefully everybody loves Alistair so we can get the next (laughs) thing. Are there other genres or, you know, sub-genres of romance that you maybe want to try that you haven't quite pulled the trigger on yet? Yeah, so there's definitely some tropes that I haven't been able to play with yet. One of them is I do love MMM. I love a good menage romance. My first series as AF has one eventually, but it's dark and all of that. So I don't see a ton of lighthearted comedic MMM. So book seven of Harmony of Hearts will actually have that comedic element At this point, it's called Rhapsody of Three. And so we meet Chance Prince. We meet him in Gaycation in Paradise on a photo shoot. And we find out he's actually filming a movie in Sunnyside. So in book seven, we find out that Duke, who owns the bar, the Hurley Burley Bar and Grill, and Early, who owns the Brouhaha Cafe, they're married. And we kind of open with a scene with the two of them, with Jason, Orion, and a couple of other people that you meet throughout the series. And they're all talking about who's your hall pass. And so for Duke and Early, their hall pass is Chance. And then he shows up and starts using their locations as a place for filming this movie about a guy who falls in love at an open mic night. And magic happens. And I think it's really going to be fun to have that kind of trio based on like their hall pass comes true like how many people get that experience (laughs) yeah so i think that that that's coming in the future 
And I have my first silver fox up on deck. That'll actually be book six. So Chance's father, we find out about Sir Prince, which like, that's a name. <laughs> like That's a he great put that, name. <laughs> yeah, he put that in there. And I was like, oh yeah, Sir is going to be a lot of fun. And so Sir was like back in the day, one of those big bands, the rock stars, and the rock stars of like the 80s and all of that, they have these cover bands where people like, pretend to be the other band members. And so there is a cover band of Sir's band, which is Four Princes, but they're called the Faux Princes since it's a cover band. And his dad, Sir, ends up falling in love with the guy playing him in the band, whose name is Calixto. And so that's that's going to be a fun one where I've never seen anyone do a guy fall in love with his cover band partner so i think that for a silver fox romance i think it's it's gonna be uh, there's gonna be a lot of sass and snark in that one it's gonna be a lot of fun so <laughs> so much good stuff on the horizon <laughs> good thing i write fast <laughs> <laughs> switching it up to things that you've read recently what, what are some books that you would recommend to our listeners that have really resonated for you lately yeah, so lately I've actually been trying to get into audiobooks because I'm trying to future forecast and someday I would love to have my books in audio format. And since for me, Lucy Lennox was the first person that I read, I was like, well, let me dive into her audiobooks first. And so for me, I have a lot of Irish characters who show up in my books. They just, they keep popping up. I do love a good Irish lad. And so I thought, well, her Hudson's Luck, which is part of her Forever Wild series, she has an Irish character in that one. So I kind of wanted to hear how that would work and sort of think about, you know, how would it sound in, you know, Love Means More and Fancy Love, where I have two Irish brothers in my Good Bad Ideas series. And so listening to that book that I have read, it was just like, oh, such a good book. <laughs> So Lucy's always the person that I kind of end up going back to and, you know, looking to as she's been a wonderful mentor to me as well. So I like kind of revisiting her stuff and, you know, she has a new book coming out, Thick as Thieves, that I'm really excited about. So I'm like, yay, more new stuff. <laughs> yeah, you picked a good one for the Irish because Michael's take on Charlie is just yes. so spot on wonderful. So good. Yeah down the road in the future we'll be able to do that <laughs> and you know we've talked about the future all over the place while we've been talking can you lay it out for us kind of what we can expect to see after play by heart comes out so after play by heart comes out i have make music together it was the one i mentioned earlier about levi who's a drummer he's moved to sunny side since jason is located in Sunnyside. That, I believe, comes out sometime in June. I think June 18th, pretty sure. And what about Sweet Dreams 6 and 7? I ended up cutting those out temporarily, and I'm possibly going to put them later in another series. So I had in Honeymoon Ever After, we meet Declan, which is Kieran's brother. And he's going to end up in Sunnyside, going to university. So I think he might show up in Brouhaha in my fourth Sunnyside series after Harmony of Hearts wraps up. So he'll probably show up there. And then we had the twins that were Rory's brothers. And one of those is going to show up in my reality TV series on like a Project Runway kind of a show. And he'll become best friends with West. And I'm not quite sure what's going to happen to the other brother. I don't know where he's going to fit yet. So right now, Sweet Dreams is complete at five books. But we'll still, there's people in there that we'll meet in future series. And I'm really excited to tackle. I love, I love how you've gone for the whole connected universe thing. Very much like Lucy's done since yeah. Maid Marian and Forever Wild and Astro Valley are all essentially under one big tent. <laughs> Yeah, and I have a bartender that you meet. I believe the first time you meet him is in Love Directions, which is book five of Good Bad Idea. And he is just, his name is Red. He is just this charming, charming guy. And he keeps popping up every so often because he works at Duke's Bar. So anytime anyone goes to that bar, Red sort of shows up. And I have so many people who keep emailing, when is Red getting his story? I'm like, I'm pretty sure it's in Bruhaha. Just hold on. I'm working on it. I promise the wait will be worth it. 
it'll be a fun one. His cat gunk will be involved. It'll be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> How can people keep up with you online so they know all of the latest details on what you're working on and, of course, what your dad is baking? Yes. The, the best way to do that would be to sign up for my newsletter. You can do it at ariellazoel.com or you can sign up the back matter of any of my books. I have a link for a bonus chapter that'll get you on my newsletter as well. I have a Facebook group called Ariella Zoel Sunnyside. It's a wonderful place. We have a really warm, inviting, cozy group. We're very active. So if you want a place to chat at me, that's the best place to kind of reach me on a daily basis. But I'm also on Twitter and Instagram at Ariella Zoel. And those are probably the best places to reach me. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, Ariella, it has been so wonderful getting to talk to you. I love everything that we've talked about <laughs> and learning it's more It's been about fun. Books. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure getting to talk to you. 